this is the, the agenda for the weekend, right? Today we're talking about beauty everywhere. So, so far I've only, only shown you na natural beauty. Um, but tomorrow we're going to talk about how is beauty connected to the beauty of God, yeah? And then I think, I think that's going to be a really good one. And then the third one is going to be the power of beauty, like how it actually transforms you. You know, like I, I said, I told you earlier that we don't actually do anything outside of beauty. We, everything we do is in the pursuit of excellence, perfection, of wonder, of glory. Everything we do is motivated by beauty. Um, so not only, do we, not only do we pursue it, but it actually transforms us. That's the power of beauty. But I also want to recognize that there's also a certain beauty in brokenness too, right? Um, I don't know about you, but I have like image issues. Uh, I look at some of you tall guys and I'm like, dang man, I wish I was that tall. And like, you know, I pray to God, like, heal me, make me taller, right? But you know, like, I have to accept that there's a certain beauty in shortness, in my deficiencies, in my ina inadequacies, in my, my weaknesses, even in my failures, there's some kind of beauty in it. So that's the agenda for all of our sessions, okay? Today though, this is the, the agenda for just today. Beauty is found everywhere, from the smallest thing to the largest thing. We also pursue beauty in every activity that we do. And we, you guys already wrote it down. I don't have to really prove it to you, but I will. Beauty serves as a signpost that points to God. And I think it was, that someone, one of you said over here that it's transcended, that it points to something else. You're absolutely correct. Was it you, Maria? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Beauty does point to something else. Beauty is always a sign that points to something else. And I'm telling you that, that el something else is actually God. Because beauty can, me can mediate the presence of God. Every time you experience wonder and awe and inspiration and joy and delight, that's like a, a glimpse, a little foreshadow of our, of our encounter with God. Beauty can medi mediate God's presence. Okay? So the fancy term for this is Right. How do you say this? Theological aesthetics. Yep. You took a class in it in college. I did. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> official definition that I've, I've been working with is that it's the study of beauty from science, art, philosophy, theology, with an emphasis on how to, on the praxis of beauty for, for the church and culture. So how do you leverage beauty for God, right? Uh, but I'm not that smart, so this is my definition. It's the study of how beauty leads you to God. Okay, that's this weekend. Um, it's pretty uh, appropriate at, that at a retreat, you learn how to be refreshed. That you learn how to be restored by God through beauty. And beauty is around us all the time. So we can constantly be refilling, refueling, always. But that's only if you have the eyes of faith to see. Yeah? So now we go into our lecture time. You ready? You good? Uh, somebody read this out for me. What does that mean? What do you think this means? Like personally, like when I like I like to hike and be outside, and like when I'm out there, I'm like, there's just no way, like this could just be random. Mm. You know, like it just mm. always looks like somebody like handcrafted or hand painted. It's a perfect example. What else do you think this means? I get to um, <coughs> spend a lot of time with people in their hurts and in their doubts. And there's events in life sometimes that lead somebody to a strong feeling of doubt. Yeah. I've been doing that for over 25 years, but I've never had somebody come and say, I'm going through some serious doubts. Like, why? Because I've just been seeing how beautiful like, my child is, or how wonderful mm. the world is. That's never, at least, yeah, so that, that's, wow. that speaks to me. I, I'm, maybe somebody's felt that, but I've never heard that before. Yeah. It's always been on the other side. Something yeah. horrible, right. broken, or terrible. Yeah. Ugliness. Ugliness might lead to, but not beauty. One more. One more interpretation. <clears throat> like even like you know like some when something horrible does happen stuff like that there's like little things you can like 
you know what I mean? Like, like little things you can like think of and stuff that'll pull you through, and like that kind of leads you, you know, that leads you towards God. Like if, you know what I mean? Like yeah. something tragic happens and you're like, oh, but like this, and then you have that one beautiful thought, and then you can like hold on to it and leave you know. Mm. Yeah, he definitely um, keeps you going, right? Uh, do you know who these two guys are? That's Steve Jobs. Uh, that yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> so <laughs> close. Yo, yo, ma. I was right. Dude. Um, let me read you a story about these two guys. D- do you know about the their friendship? No. No. All right. Let me tell you. Um, there was one classical musician that Jobs revered both as a person and as a performer. Yo, yo, ma. The versatile virtuoso who is as sweet and profound as the tones he creates on his cello. They had met in 1981 when Jobs was at the Aspen Design Conference and Ma was at the Aspen Musical Festival. Jobs tended to be deeply moved by artists who displayed purity, and he became a fan. He invited Ma to play at his wedding, but he was out of the country on tour. So one day he came by Jobs' house a few, day, a few years later, sat in the living room, pulled out his 1733 Stradivarius cello and played This is what I would have played at your wedding, he told him. Jobs teared up and told him, you playing is the best argument I've ever heard for the existence of God, because I don't really believe a human lung could do this. Yeah. So that's an example. Uh, Jobs was not a Christian. Not even a theist, really. I think he was Buddhist. But... When you encounter beauty, it, it's convincing. It's persuasive. It tells you that there's got to be something more. You know. Um, how many of you? How many of you have heard of general revelation? The patent students. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, Bible school. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what? Dummy's definition. What's what's general revelation? Yeah, world yeah, versus divine. Yeah, yeah. So there's like two major ways that God reveals himself, right? He can do it through creation, your conscience, culture, imagination, or he does it through like actually like meeting you in person and then having scripture and having theology, right? God can meet you through that stuff. So this is like stuff, you don't even have to be a Christian for God to reveal himself to you. Yeah? You see that? You just need to be human. <laughs> and God will show himself to you through everything. So my question to you now, let's do a small discussion. Does nature, the conscience, culture, and imagination, does that reveal God fully? Can you give an example of that stuff, though? Like, yeah. Um, I just feel like, I feel like I'm, I'm thinking like way off the map, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, well, Steve Jobs heard classical music, thought it was amazingly beautiful, and he was like, this is the best argument for God. Like, music spoke to him and told him that God is real. So that's an example of culture. You had an what was your name? Janae. Janae. Janae had an, she went hiking up to mountains, and that experience told her that God is real. That's, that's general revelation from nature. Conscience. You know what that is, right? Something in you tells you what's right and what's wrong. Yeah? So, is this enough? Does this reveal God fully? Yeah. 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 I'm going to give you an example from the Bible, okay? 
Paul was, was in Athens, and the Athenians are not like of, the, of the, the followers of the way, right? They're not Christians. They're pagans, in a sense. They're, they're Gentiles. The Greeks are pagans. But in this story, Paul doesn't actually criticize them for their idolatry. He doesn't say, hey, you guys are idiots. You are pursuing the wrong God. He actually says that in their groping after God, that there's actually a sensitivity. They're actually right. That, that God has truly revealed himself to the Greeks. It's crazy. He affirms that, that their search is good, but he also corrects them. He says, but it's not the full revelation. You still need to come to know Jesus Christ. Right? So that you are right. Darnell? General revelation is partial. It's not full. Okay. Um, so all of these examples that I've talked to you about beauty, that, that God can minister to you through beauty, it's, um, it's not the full thing. It's a helpful thing. It points you in the right direction, but you still need an extra like boost. What do you guys think that boost is? Uh, scripture is it? Yeah, we actually need something else to mediate Scripture to us. The Holy Spirit. Ah, the Holy Spirit. So, <laughs> without the, the Holy Spirit, you'll experience the, the beauty of nature, and you're like, "Oh, so amazing!" And then you walk away with just that. You wouldn't actually come to know that God created nature, that God gave this to you as a gift. You know, so you need the Holy Spirit to like transform something beautiful into something glorious, okay? But I'm, I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit is always moving, always speaking to you. You just need to have the ears to hear, okay? So there's, there's categories of beauty. I already asked some of you guys to do it. There's natural beauty, everyday beauty, artistic beauty, and human beauty. Um, and I'd like to go through all of them. But are you guys tired? It's nine o'clock. You guys are tired, huh? I wouldn't hear any human beauty. I told these guys that you'd be speaking until 11.30. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Good. Wow. Yeah. They're pretty devout. <laughs> pretty devout. Good. Some of you will make it to heaven. Um, <laughs> we also believe in the beauty of chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> hey, who's making the cookies? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll make the cookies Yeah, there. yeah. Okay, do I have any scientists here? Like, like, well, geologists, biologists? Yeah. Science? Science. Science. What, do you, what do you do, Johnny? I teach physics and chemistry. Okay, okay. If I am wrong, it's because I got it from another book, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. I'll tell you if you're wrong. Okay, okay. That's tell another one of Johnny's gifts. He'll let you know if you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> the gift of criticism. <laughs> That's good. All right, so I told you that beauty can be found from the smallest thing to the largest thing, right? We're gonna start with the small, the, the micro marvels, things, the, the beautiful things that happen at the smallest level, okay? Super strings. I don't know much about this, but super strings are crazy, right? They're so small. They're, it's been said that an atom compares to the earth in size, so, to, so a super string compares to an atom. Can you put that scale in your head? Like, think of the planet Earth. Say that again? Think of the, the planet Earth and how small one atom is in comparison to the planet. Mm -hmm. Now think of that as the scale to a superstring. It's like... It's like that, yeah. yeah. So small. I feel like I'm at the SAT. <laughs> Super small. <laughs> yeah. What about DNA? What's special about DNA? Um, so if you want to collect information, you have books, microfilm, computers, you can store a lot of data in hard drives, right? But no human technology compares to what we find in biology. A single cell contains more information content than all 30 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Do you guys even know what that is? Yeah. You guys know what that is, right? Yeah. It's like 30 volumes. Yeah, so one cell, and cells are small already, right? But one cell has more information than like a whole set of encyclopedias. DNA is so efficient that all the information needed to specify an organism as complex as you, it weighs less than a few thousand millionths of a gram. So what does it take to make you? 
or something real small. That data is enough to make you. It makes you think twice when you look at a kid, right? Kids are miracles. Like, how did you come to be like that? that you, you shouldn't. It's, it's unfathomable how much information it takes to make a human being. Um, so we have printing presses that can churn out tons of copies of a newspaper, right? That's a, that's a fast way to manufacture. Enzymes are better than that. Enzymes are, using enzymes, living cells can assemble some compounds in less than a second. If you were to try to like do that in a lab, uh, it would take you several hours, days, or even weeks. So like the enzyme can do that in a second, but it takes us like weeks to do that, what they do, right? We are not even close to being able to replicate what our bodies can do, as vast as our science, as amazing as our science is. So that's at a micro level. At a media level, media is like, it's the midpoint between the incredibly vast and the incredibly tiny, right? These are things that you can actually see. Compare a bird to a plane. A jetliner needs two to three miles of runway to take off and land, but a bird only needs a few inches. Next time you see a bird land on a, on a branch, think to yourself, how much mechanical genius it takes to, to do that? We can't do that. We're so inefficient compared to animals, right? <laughs> How many of you like watermelons? Mm -hmm. Yeah? My wife and I eat like 30 watermelons in the summer, right? <laughs> uh, one watermelon seed, one watermelon seed has the power of drawing from the ground through itself 200 times its weight. You know, watermelons are heavy, right? Heavy. But how did it get that heavy? The seed sucks in water from the soil 200,000 th times its own weight. How? No sponge can do that, <laughs> right? No vacuum can suck that much. But a watermelon does. You eat it all the time. And do you ever wonder to yourself, wow, how does this fruit do this? No, you just think, mm -hmm. it's <laughs> so good. <laughs> I don't wonder. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, somebody smart described to me the Fibonacci sequence. Mm -hmm. It's um, the of some values, so it starts with zero, zero plus one, one plus one is two, so zero, one, two, add those, so on and so forth, and then it, it is in different shapes and creates a spiral. It's the way that dandelions and flowers mm -hmm. petals create, so like each petal is available to the sunlight in equal amounts. Wow. The shells. Um, yeah. Yeah, they call it, they call it a certain ratio. Golden ratio. This is amazing. One plus one is two, one plus two is three, one plus, no, three plus five is eight. This is crazy, right? Like it's, a, it's math. Somebody, some of you said that math is beautiful. Uh, somebody, somebody with a beautiful mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, it is. It's like the most efficient way to collect sunlight for flowers, right? So look at how the Fibonacci sequence plays out in nature. What's the first one on the left? That's a caterpillar. I think it's because you're sitting on the side. Yeah. So there's, there's a sunflower, and there's, I think that's, that's a succulent. Um, this is not just in plants. It's also in galaxies, the way the galaxies spin. How is it that nature can be so consistent, following the same patterns? Huh? There's a connection. There's a connect. There's some connection there. I, we don't know. How many of you like hummingbirds? Yeah, hummingbirds are pretty cool. The physical powers and endurance of, of many animals are difficult to believe. Who's 170 pounds here? What? Okay, oh. well, men. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Put your hand down. You're 170 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> At some point in history, yeah. Yeah. I was 170 pounds. You can show, you can show one. And I took pride in it. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, you're, you're 170, I'm 164, <laughs> okay? <laughs> if, you expend, if you expended energy as rapidly as a hummingbird, if you tried to hover, you would, you would need 285 pounds of food a day 
and you would shed 100 pounds of perspiration per hour just to keep your skin from boiling. Yeah, yeah, right? You eat more than... You eat the easy part, right? You mean like without calories? You need like way more energy. Yeah. 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 So, how do you compare? Like, humans are so weak compared to animals, right? Um, an ordinary car can drive uh, on 20 to 25 miles per gallon, unless you're driving a Prius. Um, this bird, they can travel 2,400 miles in four days and four nights. That's equivalent to 720,000 miles per gallon. This little bird. I bet you you look at this bird and you're like, oh, boring bird, Instagram, right? But this bird is like so efficient. It's amazing. An ant can lift <laughs> 50 times its weight. I can't even lift my own weight. Is that ant called the caterpillar? Yeah. You're right, it's a caterpillar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Prophetic. Yeah, prophetic. Yeah, that's good. A bee can draw a load 300 times its weight. Can any of you do that? An oriental rat flea can jump 600 times an hour for three days without stopping. I can't even jump rope for like five minutes without skipping or without stopping. Right? A midge can beat its wings 113,000 times a minute. It's incredible. Right? Like, there's such artistry and genius around us all the time, if only we noticed, right? An elephant has 40,000 muscles in its trunk alone. Wait, what? <laughs> just in the trunk. And with that trunk, it can either pull down a tree or it can pick up a pin. Right? Incredibly strong, but also very, very sensitive and delicate. Bees are mathematical geniuses, right? They have, somehow they know that of all the geometric forms, the best to hold wax, B selected the hexa hexagonal form. Six equal sides with six equal angles. That's the best way to hold wax. How did bees figure it out? <laughs> they don't know math. They can't talk. You know? They don't have a compass or a protractor. Huh? I mean, they find their eyes using the angle of the sun based on their focus. How did they even do that? They have like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is to say that creation is a book proclaiming the creator. It's a book of beauty that your intellect reads, but through the passageways of your senses, the five senses. Okay, so through your senses, um, touch, taste, smell, hearing, sight, through your senses, you can read about God. Everyone. So those are the, the media marvels, right? The things in the middle. What about the macro marvels? Can you tell where I'm going with this? You can bring it under Big. The sun. The light of the sun takes eight minutes to reach us. If you took a jet plane, it would take you 18 years to make that same trip. <laughs> 18 years? <laughs> yeah, some of you are like 18 years old, right? Your whole lifetime to get from here to the sun on a jet plane. Um, this is, this is, these numbers don't even make sense to me because Approximately 657 million tons of hydrogen are converted into 650 million tons of helium each second. That's a lot of energy, right? Where did the 4 million tons go? <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know? I, I do. You know, uh, it's, uh, what is it? It was converted to energy. Energy. Yeah. It's shooting out? It's electromagnetic. Some <laughs> um, yeah, that's a lot of energy being with, thrown out there, but over the next six billion years, um, the, this loss of energy will cost the sun only 140, what do you, how do you say that? One, four, forty thousand of its enormous mass. So if, if uh, an electric company like PG&E was to try to replicate this, it would cost them Seven times 18 zeros behind that. Yeah. Yeah. That's how much it would cost for the first. That's how much it would cost to run the energy of the sun for one second. 
seven times ten. Yeah. Or the U.S.'s gross national product for seven million years. That's how much it would cost to run that electric plant. That's a lot of light, a lot of heat coming out, right? Um, here's a planet on, on was it, Antares? It's a red supergiant, 700 times the, sun, the sun's diameter. Can you see our sun on the, on the diagram? Right, Antares is that one over there, and our sun's right here. So that's the scale, right? Wait, that's our sun? That's our sun. Yeah. Compared to that sun, right? <laughs> sun. Why that oh, white? sorry, it's not that dot, it's this dot. Times the that dot. Okay, why is that sun white? Look at this. What are we looking at? The Hubble deep field. Yeah. I know where that is. Yeah. You don't? Them at the stars. There it is. Yeah. I'm sure there's a cataclysm somewhere in this picture. Exactly. <laughs> um, basically, they held a camera <laughs> to space for a long period of time, and this is what they got. Science, this is, I, I found this like two or three years ago. The universe may hold 10 times more galaxies than we actually thought. That number is between 1 trillion to 2 trillion galaxies. Right? So, like, Earth is in the solar system, the solar system is in something else, it's in something else, it's in something else, and then we're in the Milky Way, right, the galaxy. There's like what, two trillion of those. Now, does that make you feel like a speck? No, I'm fine. It's amazing. It's feel like a speck yet? The middle school does a pretty good job of that. That's facts? That's facts right there? That's facts. Then aliens no doubt exist. There's no so doubt. Max Bay just goes off, no. I guess. Yeah. 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 <laughs> God, God, <laughs> he, stretched, he stretched the heavens and the earth, right? You know, he, he didn't okay. just scatter okay. everywhere. Okay. Let's talk about that later. Let's talk about that later. Um, so I told you, there's one to two trillion galaxies. Each of those galaxies has two to four billion stars in it, right? So uh, I'm trying to give you a big scale here of, of beauty. It's crazy, isn't it? Um, let me show you a video. Have you ever heard of the Cosmic Zoom? Yes. Okay, it's going to be three minutes long. Um, <laughs> Is that 23 minutes long? No, 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 it's three minutes. It's only three minutes long. It's <laughs> not that beautiful. He's got to fill up Sorry. 1130. I told him that I'm tired. Okay. You've seen this before? <laughs> Thank you, Samantha. So we're going to start off um, here. And I want, to, I want you to look at the scale of things, right? I want you to know your place in this, this creation.
Keep going. Oh my god. Bro. Uh, eight protons, eight neutrons. I feel like David Welcome to the universe. That's crazy. Thank you, Samantha. Um, that's crazy. What do, what do you guys think about that? Right? <laughs> you don't like thinking about the it? cosmic web. Like, how do we know all that stuff exists? Like, if nothing's yeah. been there. No, I, I think they know it exists, and then they just give it a name. <laughs> but how did they, how did they find out that exists if no one's been there? Though? Like, like, if no one's been there, how do yeah. How we know if you don't hit like a black well, wall? No, no it's not that no one's been Everybody's been there. We're all there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> this doesn't sound like the dinosaur thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot more questions than there are answers, okay? Um, but I will say this then. The beauty that you find in nature, uh, it's not just a sentiment, right? It's not just like a feeling. From galaxies to snowflakes to electrons, Natural beauty serves to point a science to God. Okay? Um, Alfred Whitehead said this, the teleology of the universe, the end, the, the, the work, the, the, the destination is directed toward the production of beauty. Okay? So that's natural beauty. Okay, that's natural beauty. There's also everyday beauty too. What if you came home one day and you saw your door like this? Wait, wait, what are you talking about? Like, this is your door. Fat earthquake. How would you feel about your door? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, does this bother any of you? Why? Because it's not lined up. Because it's not lined up? Yeah. It'll bother you? Yeah. Does it look right? I mean, it, it, it might be the look. Yeah. yeah, I like how you incorporated the word as aesthetics. Good. I mean, this is aesthetics, right? Like the aesthetic of the house. How does this look? Yeah. Yeah. There's. If you, what if I? What if I was like, hey, you're invited to my house for dinner, and I just like threw the plates and napkins and forks and stuff, any array, it doesn't matter. How would you feel as a guest? Confused. Yeah. Where do I sit? Which one is mine? Stuff like that, right? So in our everyday lives, we're always pursuing beauty. Um, you have a desire to make things look right. You know? Something, they have to fit. They have, uh, something's appropriate, right? They, it has to be appropriate. There has to be an appropriate arrangement. Things have to look right. Um, we, also do, we also look for it here, too. Who's this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> she was one of my favorites too. Um, imagine, imagine if Simone Biles like you know did her gymnastics and she was like, you know what, whatever's whatever's, I don't care. I'm just gonna do it for the sake of doing it. I mean, would it ever be this good? No. Not really, right? I mean. No. Most of you, if you're really honest about it, you don't do things just for the sake of it. You try to be the best at, at, at that thing, right? You don't settle for mediocre. I mean, how many of you play video games and you're okay with dying all the time? <laughs> right? No. No, you gotta win, right? You gotta get that KD ratio. <laughs> What's KD? Kill to death ratio. Okay. <laughs> That's really rated R, man. <laughs> I'm like 80 and, 80 and 20, it's man. Insane. <laughs> so, if, if I asked you, like, in your relative fields, whatever you're doing, most of you will probably do it with excellence, with precision, with high quality, right? That's part of beauty. That's what beauty is, like, perfection. Excellence, right? Most of us are not happy with it. What if you bought, like, a, a sweater, and that sweater had, like, you know, holes here, holes everywhere. <laughs> and it was like... It, it wasn't even clean, right? <laughs> you wouldn't be satisfied with mediocre or messed upness. You want things to be good. Um, 
this is a Tesla factory, right? We don't like to be redundant. We don't like to, to just do things like haphazardly. We try to be as efficient as possible, right? Usually. Some of you are lazy, so you won't get it. But, but beauty plays a part in our everyday life, in everything we do. All right, how many of you are artists? You don't have to be a professional artist, just you do the arts. Cool. What do you do? Photography. Ah. Uh, what do you do? Yeah. You play sports. Mm. <laughs> yeah? He's like a... Other dudes don't see it that way. He's like... He's, like a, he's an artist on the football field. Uh, Samantha, are you, do, do you do any arts? Do you do anything else? Nothing, nothing? Okay. You did some. What do you do? Dance. You do dance. Like a car, but I'm the amateur. Yeah. You also kill a lot of people virtually. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. I'm an artist with a battle rifle. <laughs> <laughs> it takes skill, right? Yeah. You're a musician. Who do you play? Do you, do you play something in Victoria? I open Oreos. Got it. Got it. Almost, almost hit you with that one. Clayton, you do art, right? Yeah. What do you do? AV, that's good. Well, classically, you have the art like drawing, painting, ceramics, photography. You have architecture, sculpture. What's which one is beautiful? Yeah, where is that at? It's in London. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the pursuit of beauty happens in a lot of spheres, right? It's also in music, in theater. You recognize that that was Hamilton? Yeah. You have sharp eyes. Uh, also in dance, right? So beauty is found everywhere. I'm just going to list out a few here, a few more. Um, there's also literature, um, film, fashion, oh, food, sports. Sports, there it is. Hobbies. Yeah. hobbies are hobbies. beautiful. Yeah. yeah, hobbies are fun too. You know, you do a hobby because it's, it brings you joy and brings you delight, right? Exactly. So it's beautiful. Um, fun fact: I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That's hey. that's my sport. Well, hey, you do? Yeah, okay, let's go right here, right now. Oh no! Just kidding. Um, we'll talk. What, what, what belt do you? What belt do you? Oh, I, I have no belt. Okay. No gi? Uh, no. I have never done gi. Okay. What are you? Purple. What? How close to black? That's halfway. You're halfway? Yeah. So you can halfway beat me up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a nice setup. Uh, <laughs> uh, I apologize 100%. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'll get you in your sleep. Um, so... <laughs> So, why do you pursue these things? Like, what makes you pick up the guitar, pick up the video game? Like, why do you do it? It's fun. It amuses. It's only fun when you're good at it, though. Yeah. If you're bad at it, you don't want to do it. I just got to put it down. Like, well, well, you start out bad and then you get better. Yeah. Something very fulfilling. Practice is yeah. perfect. It's satisfying to see progress. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. especially if you need to you want it to get better. If you, if you stay stagnant, it's like kind of dead. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to tell you, we do it because it's beautiful. Art moves us because it's beautiful. And, it, and it's beautiful because it means something. It does something to you. Okay? Why is art so powerful? When I first heard this, um, I, it really had changed the way I looked at art. Have you guys ever gone to a museum and you're looking at a painting and you're like, what? Yeah. Banana duck duck it to wall. Yeah. Yeah. Or like an upside down toilet thing. Okay. I don't know if that's really art. <laughs> Some people say that if you don't understand it, it means it's right. It's doing something. But this is the reason why I think art is powerful. Art is an incarnation of truth. It penetrates beneath the sur surface of things to portray them the way they really are. What do you think this means? 
how can art be an incarnation of truth? Well, I, I have like a story, I guess. Well, like, okay, so I volunteer in D.C. at um, a juvenile detention center, and we were, we like teach, we do um, curriculums every month, and we were doing like reflection, self-reflection, where we were teaching them about like writing or like reflection in that form, and like a lot of them already like made music or like did spoken word or poetry as a way to like express themselves. Because like, mm -hmm. in like, we like music, I feel like a lot of the times, mm -hmm. it's because it's so personal. And like, I feel like art is the best when it's vulnerable, like especially like poetry and music. Yeah. When somebody like makes themselves vulnerable in yeah. their art, they yeah. can like, better. Yeah, you are revealing yourself exactly. through your art form. Expressive, expressiveness is a, is a good term. I think art can, it, it makes you sort of like try to conceptualize how someone could create it, right? When you see something that's amazing or hear something that's amazing and you're like, man, how much work went into, like, like you showed the Sistine Chapel, right? Yeah. Michelangelo. Yeah. Like, how much dedication he had. Just not just to draw like one of those figures, not just to draw Adam, but then he did it. You know, hundreds of different figures on ceiling, upside down, kind of dripping in his eyes. Yeah. And and you're just sort of like amazed at human endurance. Human endurance, human creativity. Creativity, yeah. Um, and actually, his, his paintings are, actually, are very symbolic. Like, every figure, every, even the position of the figures means something. Yeah? So, hello. Join us. Hey, uh, there's open seats everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah these are some uh, leaders and parents, so they also got their kids. So oh, yeah. Them. Yeah. Rain them in. That's good. Um, I, what I'm saying here is that art is an incarnation of truth. It tells you, what does the word incarnation mean? In, what? What's a carne asada? Stay real. I mean. <laughs> You're not wrong. But you're not right. Carne means flesh. To incarnate is to, to enflesh, to become flesh, to become real, to become concrete and material, right? So truth is some abstract thing out there that takes a concrete form in art. You get it? So not only is an artist expressing themselves, not only do they endure hard, hardships to get to that place, but they're pointing to something real about the world. Did you watch Hamilton? Okay, I won't ruin it for you. Uh, next time you participate in art, try to notice what, what truth it's pointing to, okay? Um, how many of you know the significance of Pablo Picasso's Guernica? You're the teacher, you would know. Uh, help us, what is this, what's the significance of this painting? Uh, I don't remember the event specifically, but it was uh, during wartime in Spain. It's like a bombing of a city or a firebombing of a city, I think, and so it's representing chaos, disorder, death, fear. Barbarity, terror. Um, how many of you think it's actually, it's pretty? You think it's pretty? Did you, you have to take a close look at what you're looking at. Um, it's actually ugly, yeah. <laughs> but it's beautiful. Right? It's a work of art. It's a masterpiece. I actually saw it in person. It's like, it's like as big as this wall here. Right? Um, there's, there's gruesome stuff happening in this picture. It's a representation of the terror of war, the brutality of it. Right? Things are out of place. Things are disembodied. Things, um, it's melancholy. It, it's, it's crazy. So... <coughs> Art tells you something true about it, you know? It, it points to truth. Um, 
So what I'm telling you is that even ugly art has value. It tells you something true about the world. Um, even when you look at the cross. The cross is technically ugly. Have you ever watched The Passion of the Christ? Mm-hmm. My wife won't even watch it. It's, it's too gruesome for her. It's too bloody. It's ugly. But it's beautiful at the same time. It's, it's a paradox, okay? I'm not saying that pain is beautiful, but I am saying that sacrifice and love and surrendering yourself for another person, that is beautiful. Mm, yeah. Um, another way that be- art is amazing, artistic beauty is amazing, is that it takes you out of your everyday concerns. Uh, how many of you played with like the kids today, right? You know, you, the kids constantly make up stuff. Like they make up games, they make up worlds. They they have uh, interesting ways to like come up with new configurations. They're not serious like us, right? Like us adults, we're all about efficiency and utility and functionality, right? But kids, they're not stuck in the real world, right? Kids make up new worlds. Um, they, ima- they use their imagination to create something new. Art has a way, it gives us a way to make a better world. You know, <clears throat> you can envision a new world. Like um, some people have watched Avatar and coming out of the theaters, they get depressed because this real world is not like Avatar's world, you know? Art allows us to live somewhere else, to imagine a different place. Um, so, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. One half of me is all about beauty, aesthetics. The other half of me is all about social justice. And what I'm trying to say in my dissertation is that art can give us a way to imagine a world that's just. Can you imagine a world where there's no oppression? No, pre- no prejudice? Yeah? No, no racism, no classism, no sexism. That would be an amazing world, right? It's not the world we live in. But through art, through our poetry, through our song, through the stuff that you have at your, your uh, what is it, the, the place that you work at? Oh, it's the juvenile detention. Juvenile detention center. Through their art pieces, they can imagine a better, just world. And we do it under God. So this is what I'm telling you. Artists create as many creators under the creator. Um, did you know that the first person to receive the Holy Spirit was an artist? You guys didn't know that, huh? The first person to receive the Spirit of God himself is an artist. Um, it was in, it's, it's in uh, Exodus. Look it up. His name is uh, Beziel. That's my wife over there, Esther. <laughs> so... If any of you are artists here, I want to encourage you that God wants to use you to point to truth, to create beauty under him. I mean, God's already doing it, but he made you to do more of it. Good? So that's artistic beauty. Um, now we're going to get to like the, the kind of steamy stuff. Okay? Human beauty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's getting kind of hot here. Are you guys getting hot? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Tay's hiding himself over there. Um, have you ever gazed at somebody lovingly? Have you guys ever gazed at, you know, eye to eye, gaze at a person lovingly? Yeah. Yeah. What's happening in that moment where you're gazing into each other's eyes? Friendship, connection, relationship. Connection, relationship, yeah. Unspoken communication. Unspoken communication, good. Let's be honest. You can find beauty in nature, in art, um, in everyday life, but you also find beauty in people, right? Um, it doesn't even have to be like, uh, like romantic love. It could just be like looking into the eyes of your children. Friends. Um, there's in Greek. There's like three forms of love. I'm sure you all heard it before. Uh, what are the three forms of love? Agape. Agape. That's one. Kaleo. Kaleo. That's another. 
And the last one here. Eros. Eros, okay. Um, you know, like, you, it, it's possible to love people in very different ways, right? Agape love is like the kind of love that God has for you. The kind of love where God knows who you are, knows the situation and the baggage that you have, and yet he still wants to, he still wants to be with you. Right? Most people don't have that kind of love. Oh, you're a messed up person. Bye. Right? That's, that's how they are. Uh, what's phileo love? What's phileo love? Brotherly, friendly love, right? That's the kind of, you know, bond between friends, right? Eros is a... Uh, how do you classify that love? <laughs> Infatuation? It can be. Eros. Eros, that's where we get the word erotic, right? But I don't want you to, to fixate on the word erotic. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, at, at, at a base level, eros love is a sexual desire, like you, you want sex. But at a higher level, <laughs> at a higher, my voice cracked, uh, at a higher level, eros is not simply sexual desire, but it's contemplation. It's, it's a desire to know, okay? So notice this, when you're looking into the eyes of, of a loved one, it doesn't have to be sexual. It can simply be, I want to know you. Like, you're standing before me as, as like a source of beauty, right? And I just want to take you in. I want to, like, biblically, I want to know you, you know? Um, you see the person's radiance. You see them shining. You see their brilliance shining through, right? Um, that's a glimpse. Right? In the same way that nature is a way for, for God to, to speak to you, God's love also speaks to you through Eros love too. Like in the love that you have between friends and family, and especially with like a spouse, that's the love that we have with God. Um, you actually experience this most in prayer. I'll talk about this tomorrow. How prayer isn't always just like, oh God, please give me this, oh God, please give me that. Prayer at its best is you looking at God and God looking at you. You want him to know God. You want to be with God. That's it. So that's human beauty. Um, next time you stare into somebody's eyes, just enjoy the moment. Take them in. Um, get to know them, right? For, for their entire being. Not just their physical attributes, but also the person too, right? So, I just gave you a whole lecture on natural beauty, artistic beauty, human beauty, uh, and everyday beauty. Is there a universal property of beauty? One thing that is like the thing that unites them all, that one way to rule them all, right? Like if I were to go around the room, you don't have to go if you don't want to, but things are beautiful because what would you say? There's no right or wrong answer. Things are beautiful because timeless. Hmm. Others? We went through a whole exercise over there. Think about your examples. Things are beautiful because. I'd say they're beautiful because we can experience them. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. We're not going to answer that tonight. What, Tay? They're true. Uh -huh. Wow. That's awesome. I'm not going to answer it fully tonight, okay? I want you just to think, mull over it tonight. Think about it tonight, think about it tomorrow morning. Um, we will get to a more solid answer tomorrow. But think about why things are beautiful. Um, dang, it's getting late. Um, I'm going to, this is the, my last point, okay? Beauty points to God. <coughs> beauty, is always a, beauty can be a signpost that points to God. 
Have you ever heard that saying, all truth is God's truth? Mm-hmm. All beauty is God's beauty. <clears throat> Anytime you see something beautiful, it's from God. Okay. Um, pop, qu- pop quiz. What are these? Med, medical, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So all of these are simple. Beautiful things, get this, beautiful things are the visible half of an invisible beauty. Okay? If you see it, it's pointing to something that you can't see. Right? If I see an, app, an Apple logo, I know it's the company Apple, right? If I see that snake with the, with the wings, I, it could be, I could look at it and go, oh, it's just a painting. Or I could know that that picture, is, it refers to something else, which is something medical to do with medical, medical services, right? So all beauty is, a, is the first manifestation of the, of the divine. So God, when God reveals himself to you, the first thing you see is beautiful, is beauty. Okay? Now, if I were to show you this, you may, you may feel terror, but I, I feel uh, <laughs> this is strength, right? To me, the mountain symbolizes strength and steadfastness. When I see this, I think of loving care. When I see this, this symbol, it, it reminds me of tireless flight, of romantic love, right? What other symbols can you think of? Which means what? Mm. Trees remind you of wisdom. Trees remind you of wisdom? Damn. That's super biblical. Super deep. Did you know that besides for humans, trees are the next most frequent living thing mentioned in the Bible? After humans. Yeah. Um, what symbols help you notice God? The wind? How? Ever present, you can feel it, but you may not always see it. Hmm. Heartbeat. How? Just because like, <laughs> your, your, like, you know, your body's so perfectly placed, and like your heart is, and like, it's like the center of everything. You know, when you do CPR on someone, you're like their heartbeat, mm. and it's just like, I don't mm. know, it's like, like how this was mapped out and how it works, yeah. like mechanics. It's like someone, like I just said, someone, Painted it, you know. I mean, someone put that together. Like, this yeah. didn't just mush yeah. together. Like, mm. someone. Like, this is very good. Good example. Let's do one more symbol. I gave you four, man. You gotta give me one more. The cross. The cross. What does that symbolize to you? Uh, Jesus' death. We could talk all night about that, but I won't do that to you. Um, actually, I will talk about it, about it to you. Um, you know, like sunsets are amazing, looking at the sky, looking at, you know, all that stuff is wonderful, right? Those are beauty, and God is speaking to you through beauty, but it's actually Jesus. As Christians, we believe that Jesus Christ is the clearest and brightest form of beauty. Okay? Um, I mean, there's, there's, like, there's levels, right? Like, you can look at, like, how a rock glorifies God. You can look at how children glorify God. You can look at how the stars glorify God, right? All of those have different levels of meaning. But in Jesus Christ, we have the greatest form of beauty of all. I'll just leave it at that. There's a lot to talk about. That's in session three. Um, so that's, that's my session tonight. I just want you to walk away tonight knowing that God's speaking to you always. <laughs> If you have the eyes to see, if, you, if for a second you're like, wow, that's beautiful, just think, wait, God's trying to say something to you. And just take a moment and enjoy, what is, what is God trying to do to you right there, okay? Are you good with that? Yeah. Thanks for enduring, that was a, that was a long session.